Hello people, welcome to this video. It's a what and how video. What and how. What's going on and how does it happen and what is happening? And I'll just get right into it. So when you're doing literary analysis, that's your job. You got two things. You got two things. You got your what and you've got your how. And so right in front of me, I have got page 95 of The Overstory by Richard Powers. And uh, I'm going to get into the what and the how. Um, so the what is kind of like, uh, as you're reading a novel, you want to continually build your little, little, um, little hypothesis in your mind for like what is happening and, um, and then how. So specifically in this, um, in, in this particular passage, these paragraphs, which are, you know, this many paragraphs, um, the, the what that we are learning about is that uh, Neely is a big deal. Like Neely is gonna change the world. You know, so Neely, through his computers, is gonna change the world. And not necessarily change the world in a positive way, but it's gonna, maybe it'll end up being positive, but it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's pretty powerful. Um, so he's talking about changing the way that people think, changing, changing us. He's going to change humans. Um, so, so that is, um, that's, that's what this, these paragraphs are about. The how, well, how is, you know, when we're talking about how, now we're talking about author's choices or authorial choice, we call it. And we also have, um, the, we, we also think about these as literary techniques. And there's a broad range of different literary techniques that can be used at different times. Um, the key ones that, that, uh, that Powers uses in this particular extract or this passage. And so, so what you want to do is you want to develop a relationship that like, yeah, you know what's going on. And furthermore, you know how you are being... I like to use the words like manipulated, pushed around. Um, you're being influenced. You're being invited to interpret the text um, in certain ways. And so, um, you know, even diction. You know, so diction, diction means word choice. So like when you're thinking about diction, but and a lot of people are like, oh, diction, yeah, word choice, uh, that's a thing. No, it's why specific words are used in specific contexts at specific moments that like, why that word and not a different word, you know? So his father sits watching what he has unleashed. Well, unleashed has a negative connotation to it. If something is unleashed, like, you know, a leash is what you put a dog on so that you can control the dog. If the dog is unleashed, that means it is free on its own um, and possibly for destructive things. Like you might get bit, it might mess up your yard, it could do all kinds of stuff. So. Um, so even words like that, if you wanted to examine diction, but when you're examining diction, it's not just like, you need to kind of develop a theory for diction. And I, and I just happened to see that word and it made me think of diction because uh, berates is also a negative connotation. That happens to be his mom that is doing the berating. But like both of these words are, they have, they have negative connotations. And here she is, she's negative. He was like a sadhu stoned on something, talking about her son. He's not on drugs. He doesn't use drugs. But his mom is saying that he's like that. He's acting like that. He's hooked. He's addicted. And these are all possible uh, negative aspects of computer. Think about your own social media use. Think about things like TikTok. Um, so here in the opening paragraph, we do have some diction that is, um, that's indicative, that indicates... Uh, negative connotations. That's not even the main how that I want to address in this video, but I just, it's, you know, if this is his meaning, Neely in the future is going to change the world through computers, maybe make it worse. Maybe make it worse. Um, it's kind of something that's kind of scary. We should see that in a, all of the different literary techniques, all of the different choices when you add them up together they're going to result in, in this meaning. Um, but the key ones that I, that I think he, he uses 
to very, very good effect. So when you're reading a novel, you want to kind of be looking for these things. You'd be like, oh, this page right here, there's a lot going on on this page. It's important to the, to the meaning of the novel. Um, and it's also like, I think I could explain it. Um, but the, the key ones here are uh, imagery and uh, metaphor. Which metaphor is always just one step away from symbol, you know, so so you might see metaphors and symbols as intertwined in here. I, I do. And especially foreshadowing. So I'm going to go through and read aloud and underline using my three different colors here so I can, so I can tune you into like why these three things in this particular excerpt and, and how do these three things add up to this meaning? How do they make that meaning particularly real? So, we'll see how this goes. All right, yeah, we got it, all right, okay. His father sits watching what he unleashed. His mother bunches up her blouse tails and her fist and berates all males with an earshot. Look at the boy. He just sits and types. He's like a sadhu, stoned on something. He's hooked, worse than pond chewing. His mother's hectoring will go on for years until her son's checks start rolling in. Foreshadowing. The boy never stops to answer. He's busy making worlds. Small ones at first, but his. There's a thing in programming called branching, and that's what Nile Meta does. He will reincarnate himself. He will. He will become born again, which resonates, reincarnate resonates with, um, that later in the text, we have mention of uh, Vishnu, who is a god, a Hindu god. Well, reincarnation is an idea that we see in the Hindu religion. He will reincarnate himself, live again as people of all races, genders, colors, creeds. He'll raise decaying corpses and eat the souls of the young. He'll tent high up in the canopies of lush forests. So here's our imagery. Here's a little bit of imagery. So imagery are, are times when an author evokes the senses, things that you see. And there's also metaphor in here, all kinds of stuff, but here's some pretty powerful imagery. He'll tent high up in the canopies of lush forests, lie in broken heaps at the bottom of impossibly high cliffs, and swim in the seas of planets with many suns. So. But what is this doing? So we've noticed that it's imagery here. Well, look how powerful he is. He's swimming in seas. He's, he's doing things that are impossible. So Neely's computers will change the world. He's a big deal. He's powerful. Think like Bill Gates. You know, he, his technology is going to redefine what it means to be human. And so this is imagery. It's also like somewhat, it's also symbolic because he'll raise decaying corpses and eat the souls of the young. That's like godlike power, and that is really what they're trying to get to. So I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna revise this. After, after you know, thinking about it some more and reading more carefully and looking carefully at those choices, what we're really talking about for Nile is not like Nile, is not like. Maybe not Bill Gates. Maybe something more than Bill Gates. Um, I'm just going to say God-like power in the computer realm. Programming. So all of this is a big... Um, this, this whole chapter is kind of metaphorical, too, because it's connect, connecting branching and metaphoring. Like, uh, branching and programming. It'll, he'll spend his life. So there's, there's that. Um, so this is also like this whole paragraph is somewhat metaphorical as, as two unlike things, two things that are not regularly connected are being set up as being equal. 
So I'm going to say we've got metaphor here. And the metaphor that we have is that um, like tree branching equals computer programming, coding, programming. Okay, so now if we know this, how does this? So so now we're talking about we're talking about we're just breaking it into pieces. We're breaking it into the little pieces that work together. So the fact that that this whole paragraph uses imagery, powerful imagery. So what does imagery do? Imagery um, it uses language to to uh, put the reader in to, so that you can physically almost experience what is what's being presented in the writing. Um, and what does it do? Godlike power. Okay. And what about the metaphor? Well, the metaphor specifically connects branching and programming and then goes on to kind of like symbolically, he will reincarnate himself, live again as people of all races. Well, that's, he's going to do that through his games, through his computer games that he creates. He'll spend his life in the service of an immense conspiracy launched from the Valley of Heart's Delight. That's Silicon Valley. To take over the human brain and change it more than anything since writing. There are trees that spread like fireworks and trees that rise like cones. Now, so this whole paragraph is an extension of this metaphor about programming and branching. There are trees that spread like fireworks and trees that rise like cones. Trees, oh, Oh, there was a there was a foreshadowing there too that I missed. Uh, foreshadowing is blue. He will spend his life. So the other thing that is very interesting that we have we have authorial choice and we have literary techniques is this idea of foreshadowing. The words that you should associate with foreshadowing. So one of the things that you're doing is you're building your vocabulary. You are learning the language of literary analysis. And one of the things you want to do is if you're talking about foreshadowing. You're going to talk. You're talking about uh, narrative techniques, because it's the narrator that does the foreshadowing. And thinking about the narrator in this novel, the things that the narrator can do, can do, can, <laughs> and can and does do. <laughs> Anyways, the narrator is pretty awesome, and that the narrator can move backwards and forwards in time in an instant. So it's a very powerful omniscient is the word that we use. Um, a very omniscient that they can see everything, including the future. Um, so we, we talk about that as like, if you're talking about foreshadowing, we're talking about the properties of the narrator, third person, omniscient, but also not bound by time. And also like very um, almost godlike in the power of the narration. And then there's that suspicion that we have, is this book narrated by a tree or by the species of trees or by the idea of trees? is always like in the back of your mind because because of the way that the because of the attention that the narrator gives to trees is very very interesting so this might not be a human narrator even though it doesn't come out and say hello i am a tree um, but there is very early in the novel that little that little insight let's see if i can find it very quickly where it seems like it's actually written from the perspective of a tree this is before the novel starts Trees join in all the ways you imagine us. Bewitched mangroves up on stilts, nutmegs, inverted spade, gnarled Baja elephant trunks, the straight up missile of a sal are always amputations. There is more there than you see. Your kind never sees us whole. You miss the half of it and more. There's always as much below ground as above. So this you know, this is the narrator before the move, before the book starts saying that like, yeah, the narrator can speak for trees. This is this trees speaking to human. Is the narrator always doing that? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, it's the, these are some of the mysteries that, uh, that Richard Powers offers for the reader. These are some of the, the things that are unique to his writing style that you want to become attuned to as you move your way through the novel. Um, he'll spend, he will spend his life in the surface. Oh, I was going to say, um, so if you're talking about foreshadowing, you're talking about the narrator, you're talking about, um, narrative techniques, what we call narrative 
techniques. And you're also talking about the other word that you would use is structure. You know, so how is the story structured? Well, it's not always linear, you know, that it moves backwards and forwards in time quite a bit. Um, and uh, that's those, so, so those things are related. If you're using foreshadowing, that's a choice in structuring the story in time. It's also a narrative technique, and it also is one of the idiosyncrasies is the word, like one of the things that's kind of specific, interesting, different about the narrator in this novel is that that foreshadowing is used all the time um, to give you a very wide, it's like a very big um, view of the characters. He'll spend his life in the service. Okay, now moving on. The trees are spread like fireworks and trees that rise like cones, trees that shoot without a ripple, 300 feet straight skyward, broad, pyramidal, rounded, columnar, conical, crooked. The only thing they do in common is branch, like Vishnu waving his many arms. So this is a simile, which is a, related to a metaphor, but more importantly, it is an allusion to a religion. Vishnu is a god, is a Hindu god, and later we have Buddha. So those are two other things that are kind of interesting techniques or, or, or choices is that religion, Eastern religions, not Western religion, the Western religions um, are uh, Islam and uh, Christianity and um, Judaism. The main Eastern religions are Buddhism and uh, Hinduism. And both of the Eastern religions are mentioned here. Perhaps that's because um, this is the religion of, uh, of uh, Nile's family. This is a religion in the, in the, in the land where, uh, where Douglas Pavlosek fell out of the sky into a bow, which is related to uh, the tree that, helped, that saved him, which was a fig or a ficus. Um, among those spreaders, the wildest are the figs, strangler trees that slip their sheaths around the bodies of others and swallow them, forming an empty cast around their decomposed hosts. So here's some, this is like some imagery again here, like these, like all of this right here is imagery to make a vivid visual impression on the reader so that you can, so that you can visualize what's being discussed. Banyans that pump out like whole forests with a hundred separate trunks fighting for shade of the sun. That temple-eating fig in his father's photo inhabits the boy. So here we have like some symbol and metaphor are kind of like coming together to actually infuse this character. So this is a very powerful kind of metaphor. This particular line right here, the temple-eating fig. And so that... And then we're like, okay, so this is a technique. You're noticing it. Why are you saying this? Why are you saying this? Because this too points directly back to this what. Everything that I've said, everything that I've that I have examined in this video, this probably got a little bit too long, is uh, Nile is someone who in the future will have godlike power to change the world, change how humans think, change... Uh, change civilization. And so this is what, well, if you really, really want to feel that, use a metaphor or a symbol. And so this becomes, this will become a dominant symbol. The temple eating fig in his father's photo inhabits the boy. It will keep on growing faster with each new chunk of reusable code. There it is again. There is the connection, the tree, the branch, and the code. Trees branching equals coding and programming. It will keep on spreading, searching for the cracks, probing all the possible means of escape. So this is actually destruction here too. It will change the world. You don't get change without destruction. You know, so now my, my meaning, my what is more complicated and more rich and more full because I've examined how that what comes into being. So, um, so there's also godlike power and it's a destructive power. And that was more foreshadowing too, wasn't it? It will keep, it will keep on growing. You know, so is he gonna die anytime soon? No. 
It will keep on growing faster and faster. It will keep on spreading, searching the cracks, probing all, this is all future tense, looking for new buildings to swallow. It will grow under Neela's hands for the next 20 years. And so it's like, so it's like if you really get into this stuff, it's like he's, he's layering, you know, different techniques and they're reinforcing each other. They never, they never operate in isolation. You know, it's never like, oh, foreshadowing is sweet. I don't know. So I guess we can know what's going to happen later. No, it's like, it's much deeper than that. So that, um, so that now we understand something more about Nile. We know about his future and we know that he's going to change the world. Then it will flower and become the boy's belated thanks for an early birthday present. His homage to, all this is future tense, so all of this is foreshadowing. His homage to skinny little Pita lugging that massive shipping box. And so then his relationship with his father comes back into play. His praise to Vishnu, knowing only, known only through cheap newsprint Hindi comic books he could never read. So this is his separation from his own cultural heritage is in there. His farewell to a species turning from animal into data. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> turning from a species into data? So that's like some foreshadowing. His effort to raise the dead and make them love him again. So many trunks growing downward from the same tree. The seed his father plants in him will eat the world. So foreshadowing, metaphor, so many things going on. Can you believe it? Can you believe I talked for 20 minutes about one page? Thanks for listening to the end. I'm gonna reward you with this little sound. You made it to the end. You made it to the end of the video. Yeah.